Um, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Helen for her kind invitation to be with you today. Um, assemblage is a common word in archaeology. We usually signify a group of material remains either found at the same site or connected typologically, namely via common morphological traits. This definition of the term is not too far away from its conceptualization in social theory as a heterogeneous group of entities, both material and immaterial, animate and inanimate, natural and man-made, bigger, dynamic, and more important than the sum of their components. And here's an idea, two different types of assemblages, finds from a, from a burial or same, uh, um, objects of the same uh, uh, form. Um, assemblage thinking in archaeology has combined the adoption of a flat ontology for both animate and inanimate beings, uh, as well as with the idea that agency emanates through relations of externality between assemblage components. This combination has allowed a better appreciation of the material conditions wherein and through which past social life was lived out. The idea that things are active social constituents relieved archaeologists from the burden of not being able to interrogate past and thus absent people. It became clear that the latter were only a part and not even a central one of the, uh, in the assemblages uh, wherein they, they participate. It has even been argued that archaeology has enough information to understand past assemblages only by focusing on relations between non-human entities such as the findings of an archaeological excavation. The always fluid and heterogeneous character of assemblages has made it clear that it's not the formal properties of assemblages that really matter. Rather, it is their virtual capacity to affect themselves and other assemblages. As any generalizations on social constants should address the topological features of a past society, or the so-called control dots, we heard from my note today, but, uh, uh, it, uh, these control knobs parametrize the assemblage through their virtual capacity for a spectrum of variable settings, and these in turn facilitate the actualization of this virtual capacity via specific individuations. In this uh, respect, it has been argued that <coughs> social historical evolution should be seen as a diachronic, multivariable, aleatory interplay between historically contingent inter and intra assemblage processes of virtualization and actualization. Uh, uh, or coincidentally enough, my example would be the domestication of the species that we heard about from the, the previous, uh, in the previous session. Um, I have to say that archaeology in this part of the world uh, has firmly believed for, for, for the last 30 years at least that this process was piecemeal and with a, a significant ebb and flow. Uh, and we certainly have abandoned unilinear narratives about this uh, transformation and not even change. Um, however, we don't believe, uh, we think that our Cavalli's forces work is problematic because uh, we place more emphasis on the plasticity of hunter gathering, of the hunter gathering uh, way of life and how, for example, uh, food uh, reciprocation and food favors are plastic enough so you can delay them, for example, and this way you can start building a storage uh, mentality. And this way you simply change your assemblage by actualizing your virtual uh, uh, relation of uh, food reciprocation in a different way. Um, in the same way, when uh, uh, hunter-gatherers become uh, come into contact with agriculturalists, uh, they, uh, they also start thinking in a different way. They can simply take different information input. So it's not a matter of uh, imposing agriculture, but it's a matter of these ebbs and flows of communication between different types of communities. And of course, once you have uh, agriculturists and not simply hunter-gatherers, you have a different assemblage. So different, type, different emerging properties uh, out of it. Now, uh, however, I'm, uh, what I have in mind is a particular work that uh, argues that uh, the Mesolithic was an assemblage that featured the people, the hunter-gatherers, their technologies, even the weather, the ability to predict the weather and its changes. The passage to the Neolithic has been accordingly understood as a transformation of the ways in which one of these features and their effects 
upon the crop production, or should I say actually crop growth uh, first, transform in the assemblage of sedentary communities uh, due, for example, to their capacity to understand weather changes and crop growth through a different kind of actualization, which result in sedentary farming. So, in a sense, they're saying that uh, weather prediction was controlled now, and people started actually uh, expanding the, the spectrum of this law, which actualized in a sanitary way of life. Um, I have two problems with uh, the uh, application of assemblage thinking in archaeology so far. First, a lot of archaeologists become overtly materialist and they discredit the human being as a source of agency and they produce narratives that exclude the human factor from the processes of socio-historical evolution and this is an extremity. Uh, uh, second, uh, the trending view on past societies focuses exclusively on, uh, their, um, on their being malleable assemblages only with ad hoc relations whereas as uh, Manuel has written and explained today, uh, apart from assemblages, they are also strata, which are much more stable. Uh, finally, uh, a meticulous understanding of virtuality in, in the pa in past society has yet, to, has yet to be achieved. Immanence is frequently mistaken for fuzziness, and social historical evolution is seen as obscure, chaotic, and circumstantial. Nevertheless, skewing causality along with unilinear narratives is much more like throwing the baby out with the bathroom. Well, during this rather long but necessary introduction to close, archaeology, I argue, has yet to explore the full gamut of assemblage theory and assemblage thinking. And as a first step towards such a research quest, I will focus on the remainder of this paper upon the role of people and of virtuality in past societies, and I will specifically refer to these well-known marble figurines from the Cyclades, and I will try to place them in their social context, which is no other than the societies of the central and southern Aegean in the, during the third millennium BC, or what we archaeologists call the early Bronze Age. I will argue that these figurines participate in ritual assemblages that virtualize the expressive component of early cycladic society as regards the human condition, and in this way they play a key role in the facilitation of social interaction at the time. This is a map of distribution, a distribution map of these figurines with the canonical types uh, featuring more in the center and uh, around the edges uh, we, we usually find less canonical types and imitations as the one in Crete and the other in Anatolia that you see. And this is a canonical type for reasons of comparison. Um, as you can see, they, they range in the detail, in their size. Uh, they even uh, range in the skill needed. They, they could mostly be uh, made by a single person working for a couple of weeks. However, they have uh, uh, their, their aesthetics show that there was some sort of uh, uh, elaboration uh, in their making. Some people have argued that they were uh, uh, specific artists. Um, here is a typology that we have. And as much as we can, we can see an evolution from more to less schematic types, and although the, uh, the most canonical type is the one in the, in the middle, with the folded arms, the female with the folded arms, you can definitely see how uh, all this defies any attempt to create a dendritic typology, a tree-like typology. Uh, even more so when we consider that some of them bear color marks, so they were colored. And it has even been argued that were also recolored. So you can see how variable that the whole assemblage uh, was. Uh, this one has, um, as I said, attachments made of gold. And we can even, and why not, hypothesize attachments of perishable materials on the canonical types as well. Um, the same uh, 
as a, uh, not fuzziness, but the same variability can be, fa uh, can be uh, found in their finds contexts. Figurines are predominantly found in burial contexts, so they were burial gifts. However, we find them in settlements as well, and I have to say that we don't really know the Cycladic settlements that well. We haven't excavated much of them. There is also a very special case. There's a, a small island called Keros, where we have a special deposit of non-joining fragments of figurines. We do believe that this was for some ritual purpose, but we really don't know what it was about. In terms of meaning and function, again, uh, these issues are open to speculation. Uh, we know that the figurines were part of a network of, a, of the cycladic maritime interaction all around the Aegean. They have been connected with the, with the rise of high-status individuals that had the resources to commission maritime voyages and or the skills to undertake such long and perilous journeys themselves. However, the high number of figurines and the fact that the resources and the technology for their production were relatively simple restrict such interpretation to the, to the distinct or larger examples. Alternatively, they have been considered as images of deities or fertility images, but this again, this interpretation again leaves out, for example, the male figures or the ones engaging in action. Uh, their connection to burial contexts points towards a ritual role, which they may have also played when they were uh, kept in settlements. Signs of wear and repair suggest a long and complex social biography for each one of them. The painted and re and the idea, the, this repainting idea that I told you uh, suggests the same thing: that they not only carried symbolic messages; they were some sort of some means of communication. Uh, but they actually played a central role in passage rites related to key stages of a person's social life. So, what I'm getting at is that these are actually an assemblage in each and every sense of, of the term as it has been uh, said here. They defy, uh, uh, they defy dendritic approaches, uh, they uh, and as much as, uh, and we can say that the fonded arms figurines, the female ones, in burial contexts may have been highly territorialized and encoded. The schematic types or the Cretan imitations or the any, any figurine found outside the Cyclades was literally deterritorialized and perhaps less encoded. But then again, this coding thing can be played the other way around. The schematic, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the schematic and canonical types were decoded because they're more generic, whereas the more features you carve in them, the more encoded they become. So you can see here a real assemblage with knobs that you can twist around and create different uh, instances, different individuations of the same uh, imminent, uh, level of immanence. Um, one way to understand the role of these figurines is to examine them as part of burial ritual assemblages wherein they became empowered to participate in relations that produced agency and meaning. And of course, burial rights do renegotiate the collectively held values and meanings that keep up a society. More specifically, I wish to argue that these figurines participate in a contrast of different types of the human figure. And Let's see what types of human figure that did the uh, uh, cycladic burial entail. The first type was the dead person himself or herself. Okay. The dead has a distinct transit ontological status between the world of the living and the realm of the dead. The dead is a person and thing at the same time. It has lost the ability to move, but the materiality of the dead body resists its immediate transference to a metaphysical state of being. Hence, funerary rites are about helping people to come to terms with this liminal status of the dead and also to take care of the passage of the dead body to a new state of being. Uh, people in the Cyclades also had to tackle the limited affordances for action that the dead body always retains in comparison, of course, to the bodies of the living. And they had to symbolically negotiate beliefs about these new affordances that the dead body had acquired. 
These affordances regarding not only the expressive, but also the material component of the body, of the dead body, namely the decay of the flesh. The technology that facilitated, such as the, the tools, which in the case of the Cycladis were underground built of stone cysts, or the other funerary gifts that accompanied such uh, uh, these tombs, that uh, were placed in these tombs. The second type of human figure uh, in, a, in, a, in a better ritual, of course, were the living, uh, what was represented by the living themselves. Uh, with an ontological status and affordances apparently different than the dead. But also virtualized at this point. Why were they virtualized? The event of a death amputates a community by depriving it of one of its members. The roles and resources of the deceased need to be reallocated. The web of social relations has to be renegotiated. Thus, all living persons affected by the event of death enter a liminal state of being, wherein their capacities for social interaction have to be reviewed. In other words, they become virtualized. Considering that early psychotic communities were non-urban in size and probably rather close-knit, the event of death affected many, if not the whole community and virtualized its capacity for intra- and inter discourse. Marble figurines entered this uh, contrast as the third type, of course, of, of the human figure. And again, they were in between the two different types, and they created a triangulation of contrasts about the, the human figurines. They had a different materiality, uh, harder than the, the human body, more enduring as well, Less malleable, and by less malleable, you can see how obsidian blades uh, that have been found in tombs and pigment uh, remains that have been found again in tombs as burial gifts uh, testify to the coloring or scarification or other kinds of alteration of the human body. Of course, you can scarify a living person, you can, um, uh, uh, you can create a scar on a dead person, but you cannot really scarify. Uh, uh, a figurine because it's uh, harder. So uh, you can see we can see how the acts, the burial acts, the ritual acts within the burial, uh, created uh, had to do uh, had a strong corporeal element, and we can understand how this contrast of different types of human figure became a useful uh, became useful in renegotiating uh, social relations. Um, Hence, the cycladic figurines may be understood as an individuation of the human figure, which itself could become further individuated or virtualized, depending, of course, on the context it participated and the relations it formed with other parts of the context. And, when it, and of course, it, 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 it traveled outside the cycladic context in different areas. How do we understand this in, in, uh, in relation to the community of the South Central Aegean? Well, these small and close-knit communities afforded limited capacities for subsistence and physical and social reproduction, hence the exploitation of metals and sea fire. Such reactions to a difficult way of living also created polarization between a territorialized way of life on the land and deterritorialized long-distance sea fire. At the same time, both parts of this binary position entailed a strong sense of one's own corporeality and place in relations of externality with others. And I conclude, such a social strain was renegotiated in the course of human ritual. Within this renegotiation, the cycladic figures, the figurines, afforded a pertinent and triangulated discourse on the human figure, which opened up the spectrum of variable setting of both the material and the expressive components of humanness. The figurines pushed the early Bronze Age ritual context to widen the limits of its immanence as regards the ways in which it allowed the symbolic renegotiation of both personal and collective identities. By doing so, they brought up the importance of the human figure as a control dog and a force that drove cycladic social interaction. Thank you.